Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this, this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. We appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Now, coming up today, could you be putting your dog at risk for diabetes and vice versa? Well, a new study says absolutely yes, and we have the interesting details in just a little bit when we're joined by Dr. Hanna Kaliova. Also today, Dr. Jazz, Dr. Jasmine Sardana is back making a house call to answer your questions. So if there's something on your mind related to diet, nutrition, health, whatever the case may be, go ahead and post that in the comments section or the chat box. You can also tweet it to us at PCRM, at Chuck Carroll WLC. Just make sure that you use that hashtag exam room live. Some great ones already coming in. Somebody wondering when is the best time to take B12 during the day and someone else wanting to know a little bit more about protein drinks and are they even necessary? Well, we're going to get into that with Dr. Jazz in just a little little bit. So make sure that you get your question in to the doctor's mailbag and we'll do our best to get you an answer before the end of the show. But we start today with this interesting new study about dogs, diabetes, and you. So check this out. This is a picture of me back in the day. Okay. I had no idea at this time that I was actually putting my dog at risk for diabetes. And now I'm so grateful today by adopting a plant-based diet. Turns out, as we're about to hear with Dr. Kaliova, lower risk of diabetes for me, lower risk of diabetes for Rudy. So let's dive into the details of this study and welcome Dr. Kaliova back to the exam room live. Dr. Kaliova, this is just ridiculously fascinating research. You do so much when it comes to diabetes, but I'm imagining that this is a first even for you. Uh, absolutely. This is a fascinating study. Uh, there was another study that showed an association between body weight, that it may be associated between the dogs and the owners, but this one goes a little bit deeper. So uh, let me share my screen with you. Uh, and let me start the presentation. Uh, so, you know, if your dog has diabetes, um, you need to be careful and vice versa. If you have diabetes, you might be putting your dog at risk. These are findings from a new study that has just been published in uh, the British, British uh, Medical Journal. Uh, this research comes from Sweden, and the research group analyzed the data for more than 200,000 uh, owner dog pairs. They were also looking at cats and cat owners. Uh, they had more than 100,000 owner cat pairs. Uh, and they were getting uh, the health data from the National Patient Register, and they were also getting uh, the veterinary care in insurance data. From, from the pets, for the pets. Now, what were the findings? So let's say uh, your dog has diabetes. How much would it put you at risk of developing diabetes in yourself compared to some uh, another owner who has a dog without diabetes? Um, the study showed that um, a dog with diabetes um, would increase the risk of by 38% in the owner of developing diabetes as well. And what about vice versa? So if the owner has diabetes, um, does he or she put her or his dog at risk? The answer according to this study is yes, by it's, it's increased by 28% compared to an owner who doesn't have diabetes. Now, what about cats? Uh, and cat owners? The answer is there, there was no association. Um, we know that cats are more independent uh, in, their, uh, in their behavior and in their physical activity. Dogs are more dependent on us walking the dogs uh, compared with cats. Uh, so this is a summary slide. If your dog has diabetes, um, that puts you as an owner uh, at a higher risk by 38% of developing diabetes. If the owner has diabetes, then he or she um, increases the risk for the, for the dog to develop diabetes by 28%. And cats don't increase the risk at all. 
so probably a good idea to uh, stick to your healthy diet, not only for you, but also for your dog. And lace up your sneakers and, you know, take your dog for a walk. Let me ask you, how much of this was uh, diet related? How much of this was lifestyle related? Were they able to extrapolate that information? Uh, they, they only adjusted for socioeconomic status and that didn't play any major role. Uh, their hypothesis was maybe, you know, this is only true for people with low socioeconomic status, but that was not true. Uh, this um, was even, um, this association was present even after adjusting for socioeconomic status. So no matter if you're poor or rich, <laughs> if your dog has diabetes, uh, you're still at risk of developing diabetes too. And there was a, this was a significant sample size as far as the number of people yeah. who they were looking at. I mean, it was tens of thousands, if not more, right? Absolutely. 200,000 uh, dog owner pairs and more than 100,000 cat owner uh, pairs. So it's a, it's a pretty large study. And I mean, Sweden uh, is a country um, with a high socioeconomic status, generally speaking. Uh, so it would be interesting to see uh, the association in the United States, um, but it's, it seems like Sweden might be, you know, very close to what we would be getting in the United States as well. Oh man, that is, that's really interesting. And I think that when you have that many people, um, that much data, I would think that the study then is pretty reliable. It, you know, those numbers, I mean, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of people at this point. I, I, you know, it's not like you're talking about just a handful of people or a handful of, 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 uh, animal owner. So like, this is, this is just phenomenal data. Um, we have a lot of people right now in the comments and in the chat talking about how much their animals, uh, enjoy, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables. I'm curious, like, I'll tell you my dog, um, he absolutely loves apples and carrots are his number one. Like he could just eat carrots all day, every day, and just be so happy. I think it's the crunch that mm. really sets him off. He also, uh, really enjoys it when a roasted Brussels sprout happens to drop on the floor and he gets an opportunity <laughs> to go ahead and chow down on that. Have you, have you had any, um, animals, animal companions before Dr. Kaliova? Yeah, I have the same experience. Um, we used to have a golden retriever and our dog was just loving all the veggies that we were putting uh, and giving her you know you know uh, it's it's completely the animals don't need to have the treats that we believe would treat them and i really like what uh the veterinary told your wife I, if you don't mind sharing the story as well chuck Oh yeah. So my dog is, uh, my, my wife is notorious for just showering, uh, Rudy with, with love through treats, you know, but the problem is for, you know, sometimes too many treats is just frankly too many treats. It's no different if it's you or I who's overindulging. If it's a dog, even though it's coming from a good place, it's too much. So the, the, the vet actually looked her in the eye and was like, look, food is not love. And that made the message really resonate um, and, and stuck with her. So, you know, now, um, it's not like Rudy was ever in any kind of jeopardy of being unhealthy. It was just, it goes to underscore, you know, just, we, we can't just keep expressing our, our love or our feelings through food, which, you know, we all do it. That's just kind of human nature, but it, it can become detrimental, you know, at the end of the day, if you do it too much. So I think that that's some really good advice. And I'll tell you, Dr. Kaliova, there's also a number of people right now in the uh, comments and the chats wondering, well, is it possible for a dog to eat a plant-based diet? Is it possible for a cat to eat a plant-based diet? And I actually did an episode of the exam room podcast uh, more than a year ago now uh, mm -hmm. with a vet out in Los Angeles, uh, the vegan vet. Mm -hmm. And she and I spoke about that. And interestingly, she said it's easier for a dog to do it than uh, a cat. With the cat, it can be very technical, uh, mm -hmm. but for a dog, it actually can be a lot easier. So if you get an opportunity, go ahead and head over to Apple or Spotify, look for the uh, exam room by the physician's committee and scroll through and get the episode with the vegan vet. And I think that uh, you'll be pretty, pretty surprised with what it is that she had to say.
Dr. Kaliova, this is just phenomenal research is always so interesting. So eat a healthy diet, pass that health along to your, your dog, your cat, go outside, take a walk, be healthy, be happy. And that's basically what the study is saying here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I agree. And we need it now before Christmas even more, right? Amen to that. These treats are everywhere. Treats for both dogs and humans. I'll tell you that. They are all over the place right now. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kaliova, thank you so very much. Thank you, Chuck. All right. You guys are man, you guys are just going crazy right now in the chat box with everything that you guys are, are feeding your, your animals. I love it so much. Um, we have uh, Nilufar. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly, says uh, that our rescue dogs are thriving on a vegan diet. Well, that's cool to hear. That's awesome. All right, let's move on now. Let's go ahead and switch over to human health and nutrition. And to do that, we're going to open up the doctor's mailbag and answer your questions, my friend. So if there is something regarding your diet, go ahead and post that in the comments or the chat. As always, you can also tweet that to us using the hashtag exam room live and making the house call for us today is the one and only Dr. Jazz. Dr. Jazz Sardana, thank you so very much for being here. Oh my gosh, Chuck, so happy to be here. What a crazy study, right? It is, you know, I'm not surprised. It's so, I mean, there's such this, there's such a beautiful symbiotic relationship when it comes to our pets and, and humans. So it does make sense, but it's wild. Yeah. You know, um, you, you know, Eric O'Gray, he worked with us for a little while at the physician yes. committee and his story is so, oh, so, Corey. so popular, um, how he was able to reverse all of his, uh, diabetes and other, uh, oh. health conditions and lose just over a hundred pounds, just a, a ton of amount of weight and, and how he just walked with this dog right. that he had adopted and the dog lost weight too. And so when <laughs> I hear the study, that is the first person I think of, Exactly. you know, um, so if you get a chance and you're watching this and, and this kind of piques your curiosity, go look for Eric's book. It's called Walking with Petey. Just a phenomenal read. A really, really inspiring. Really uh, but Dr. Chaz, let's uh, switch over to human health right now. We've got I'm a lot it. of great questions in here already. Um, here's one. A lot of people are wondering about B12. And this is the first time, though, that we've been asked this one in particular. It's a question from Janet. Wanted to know, when should I take B12? Is it before or after I eat? Does it make a difference? Yeah, it's a good question. So just quickly to answer the question, I, I there isn't any strong evidence to suggest that um, with or without food makes a huge difference. However, some important things to note is that vitamin B12 is a water soluble vitamin. Um, and so it might be, and it's important to, you know, and it's absorbed through an acidic environment, which is in our uh, stomach. So if you are taking, for example, medications that might reduce the amount of acidity in your stomach, for example, PPIs, um, there might be some evidence out there to suggest that that could be um, something that could interfere with your B12 absorption. Um, I don't, I, you know, I don't have um, robust data at that uh, right now that I'm seeing. However, that could potentially be a concern just because that's the environment that vitamin B12 needs in order for it to be absorbed. However, we don't, I, I don't have data or I haven't seen the evidence to show that food otherwise um, could interfere with that. So you can take your B12 uh, on an empty stomach um, or with food. And, but also make sure that if you are eating a strictly vegan diet, a plant-based diet, that you're getting those levels checked and you're following it um, to know whether that's making a difference for you. Question from Brian. Protein question. No surprise here. Uh, Byron wants to know, uh, he says he finds it very hard to get enough protein in a day. So okay. should he be drinking protein powder drinks? Yeah. So I'm going to say no to that one. Uh, you know, I'm not a fan of, um, you know, there are certain supplements that we absolutely need. Um, but again, getting it from the whole food sources is going to be the best way possible. I'd actually like to take a step back and ask, uh, you know, the listener, what is it within your day uh, that's keeping you from prioritizing this part of the diet? And that's really where the key is, right? So we see the protein powder, oh, I just need to take it. But that never really fixed the underlying issue of the fact that we haven't learned how to be able to incorporate the necessary meals, uh, the necessary foods in our diet. And, you know, sometimes just saying, oh, eat a whole food plant-based diet is just not enough. Focusing on, um, and, and to help, focusing on the protein-rich plant foods specifically and starting with say one really good option. Um, I'm going to say lentils because that's one of my favorites and there's just a, a wonderful versatility to it. 
Um, a suggestion for you is a half a cup of cooked lentils has about 12 grams of protein. Now on average, um, you know, our protein requirement, you've heard this multiple times, uh, Chuck, is 0.8 grams per kilogram. And on average for a woman, it's about 46 grams a day. And for men, it's about 56 or 58 uh, roughly grams that you need a day. So a half a cup cup of cooked lentils gives you about 12 grams of protein. And if you get that a couple times a day, along with uh, protein rich and vegetables like Brussels sprouts and broccoli, which is one of my favorites, which, you know, calorie for calorie, if it goes head to head with a steak has more protein in it. So really stepping back and figuring out how can I incorporate a half a cup of half a cup of lentils into my day into a soup? Uh, can I cook it and toss it into a salad? Can I turn it into a shepherd's pie? How can I, what are the skills that I need to, you know, improve on so that I can consistently get that protein through these protein rich whole food plants daily? I think that is really where we need to get to is helping our uh, listeners, our viewers understand the importance of um, being able to incorporate those whole foods and not just relying on a protein shake to be able to fulfill that. As a follow-up, I'm kind of reminded of an email that I got not too terribly long ago from mm -hmm. a viewer who said, I, I explained that I can get all the protein that I need from a plant-based diet to my physician, but then that physician expressed concern that it wasn't a complete protein that the person was eating. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Right. So there's this notion, uh, and it really just has to do with, you know, linguistics and, and how things have been described, but in animal proteins, because animals are so similar to humans, uh, you know, the amount of the types of proteins, the amino acids that are in animal proteins are complete and that it contains all of the amino acids that are necessary. However, plant foods, singular plant foods are not complete proteins because they don't they don't contain all of those necessary um, amino acids in one unique plant source. However, we're not just eating one type of food all day, right, Chuck? That's the purpose of, of eating is because it is to get a wide range of, of nutrients, uh, vitamins, minerals. And in doing that, you end up actually getting complete proteins. Uh, the, the classic example is rice and beans. Rice on its own uh, is not a complete protein and beans on their own is not a complete protein because they're each missing um, a, 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 an amino acid. Lysine is in one of them. I'm forgetting which one right now. Um, but when you pair them together, that combination becomes a complete protein. So it's, I think, a little bit um, uh, misleading to say that animal or sorry, plant-based proteins are incomplete. It's really just, again, comes back to figuring out how to eat it and how to pair those foods so that you are getting complete proteins and it's absolutely doable. Ah, that is phenomenal. Okay. Next question comes to us from Marina. This is a very interesting one. I like this a lot. She says, I have been vegan for almost three years, but one of my concerns is breast health. I know that you've said alcohol is bad for you, but I do enjoy the occasional beer. You're not alone, Marina. She wants to know, Dr. Jazz, what do you think though about non-alcoholic beer? Is that healthy? Yeah, so um, I'm going to break that up into two parts. I think that it's important um, what you're comparing that non-alcoholic beer to, right? So if you're comparing that to an alcoholic beverage, I would say a non-alcoholic beer is a phenomenal option. It's a great alternative uh, to getting alcoholic um, beverages and, you know, uh, you know, just even sparkling drinks. There's wonderful mocktails that are out there. Uh, I think in comparison to alcoholic drinks, non-alcoholic beer is a really good option. It, the second part to that question is, so is it healthy? No. <laughs> <laughs> Only because, you know, it's not a nutrient dense food. Um, it is, you know, a social drink that you're having. It's not a requirement. It's not necessary. So no, I wouldn't say that uh, non-alcoholic beer is a health food, um, but it certainly is a good alternative to an alcoholic beverage. Let's switch gears now and talk about maybe some pressures that we're feeling right now as some of us still may be trying to gather with friends or family for the holidays. A question from Tay Swanee wants to know, doctor, can you please talk about how to deal with society and family pressure to eat non-vegan foods? Such a really good, important subject. And I know lots of our listeners, I, I, I almost am certain that every person that's been plant-based, unless you've you know, come from a really unique family uh, or you were raised or grown up or, you know, into a vegan or plant-based household, that you've probably had to have 
a conversation or maybe had a, you know, judgmental glare or even had some, you know, unsavory comments kind of tossed your way. You know, stepping back from that, I kind of find that individuals, people who are judgmental about or make comments regarding, you know, a different style of eating, especially when it's, you know, proven to be a healthy style of eating. Uh, number one, a lot of that stems from fear, fear of the unknown. And when, uh, and, and also as aside to that, when individuals see others making healthy choices in their own lives, um, that somehow puts up a mirror to themselves. So they end up having to question whether they say it out loud or not, wait, why am I eating like this? And they're eating that way and they're being healthy. So what does that say about what I'm eating? So there is that little bit of judgment. So when people are being judgmental towards you, just know that they're also being judgmental towards themselves. And a lot of that comes from the root of just not knowing. So my recommendation would be, our suggestion would really be to help, you know, fill in some of that unknown. If they're open to a conversation, if it's a friendly, you know, uh, environment that you can have that conversation in, and they're genuinely curious, number one, just share with them why, why you're planning to, or you're choosing to eat a whole food plant-based diet. Is it for your health? Is it because of a family history that you're trying to avoid, um, you know, recurring in your own life or in your children's life? Are you doing it because of, you know, planetary health? You really care about our earth and, and making sure that we're leaving a really beautiful and healthier environment for our future children and grandchildren. Are you doing it for compassion? Are you doing it because you care about the other living beings on this planet? So sharing your important why um, can help in starting that conversation. Next, sharing with them what exactly is a plant-based diet. I think there's a lot of, you know, again, misconceptions and um, um, assumptions about what a plant-based diet or a vegan diet is. And then, you know, in every culture, we've talked about this before, Chuck, there is some iteration of a plant-based diet or plant-based meal in every single diet. Rice and beans is one, right? That's my go-to. Every, every culture has their version of rice and beans. And so just pointing out to them and saying, hey, listen, you know, there are probably some things in your life you're already eating that are plant based. I'm, and I'm choosing to eat more of those things. Um, and I would also say to get educated, right? Listen to the exam room podcast weekly, go to PCRM.org and to other trusted websites and to get a fundamental base of knowledge about plant based diets uh, and nutrition so that you can share and answer maybe some of those questions that they might have with you. Um, finally, I would say offer plant-based tasty treats. You know, if whenever you, there is a gathering, if that person happens to be there, if they, you know, happen to be judgmental or, or, or maybe um, have something to say about what you're eating, you know, just offer, you know, maybe you don't want to hear it from me. Maybe you want to try it out for yourself. Um, and then just you know, worry about you. You don't really have to convince anybody else. You really have to focus on you um, and be that example for others. And, and ultimately, it's going to be their decision uh, whether they want to follow that or not. Um, but to stay true and strong with, with what you believe. Uh, for, as someone who actually kind of went through that, having to stay strong for what you knew was right for yourself yes. and like just hearing that outside noise, but still being able to shut it down and not catering to that pressure. Uh, I will tell you that that advice that you just gave is spot on. So if you're wondering if that actually works, yes, it does <laughs> 1000%. Um, we have an interesting question here from a viewer. This is a curveball. This one just came in. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you like the sun? Do you like to get the sun and the vitamin D, Dr. Jan? Oh my goodness. Yes, please. Every day. All right. So here we go. The problem is right now we are in these winter months where the daylight hours, they're short, maybe not the best time to get, you know, vitamin D from the sun. But this person is wondering, is it possible and healthy to get vitamin D from a tanning booth? Do you know anything about this? Oh, right. Yes. Yeah, so I would highly discourage that um, period. Uh, you know, yes, there is this we're, we're, we, we know this in the winter months. Um, you know, it's much that much harder to get sunlight and to get exposure. And so we see, you know, lower vitamin D um, levels, um, not just here in America, but in other countries as well, where there's more uh, darkness throughout the day. Now, the best alternative for that, is it a tanning booth in order to get that vitamin D? No, because the risk that comes with it, you know, it's, it's not risk free, the risk that comes with it is potential um, risk of skin cancer. And that's absolutely something that's not going to, um, you know, decrease that 
that benefit, the benefit of getting vitamin D from that. First of all, I'm not really even sure that you can get vitamin D from the tanning, but if there's UV light, it could potentially convert the vitamin D into that active form, I can imagine. Um, but that's not a healthy alternative. What I really recommend is to follow up with your physician, get a vitamin D level, see where you are, and then supplement with vitamin D. And as much as you're able, um, you know, not every single day is going to be you know, in completely freezing, but as much as you're able to, even in the winter one, uh, even in the winter, winter months to be able to go outside and get some of that fresh sun as much as possible. There you go. Great advice. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, my wife loves that. If, if it were possible, if we had a pool in our backyard in <laughs> January, she would still be laying out uh, beside of it. Um, we got time for just a couple of other questions. We were just talking about pressure. So here's a really great one from a viewer by the name of Goshen. But this pressure is coming from their physician. What does a pregnant mom say to their OB doctor that insists on incorporating meat into their diet? Right. This is this is a tough one. I think you really have to surround yourself with a team, which is why I think, you know, Barnard Medical Center, PCRM offers such a beautiful resource for our patients and our, our viewers, our listeners, because, you know, this is what this is not what's conventionally taught in medical school. Unfortunately, we don't get a lot of this education, you know, hardly. And so it's not surprising to me to hear that, that the physicians, uh, you're getting a little bit of pushback from that physician. So if you are getting that pushback, number one, here are a couple alternatives. One, you could consider, you know, depending on your relationship, you could, you could consider, a, you know, a second opinion or look for um, a provider who is plant-based and would align with your beliefs and your values and would support your diet. You could go to plantbaseddocs.org to find um, a potential, um, you know, not just an ob guide, but, you know, there's several different practitioners and specialists that are on that list. Um, if you'd like to, number one, so you could either switch the provider if that's possible. Um, and then number two, you can supplement, right? You can build a team so maybe that particular physician is saying, no, this isn't, you know, necessarily healthy, but hey, um, you know, I can, you know, consult with a lifestyle medicine physician and really get some of that data or another plant-based physician and get some of that data so that I am reassured that there is a health professional who understands the data uh, <clears throat> and has read more of that <clears throat> data and has more of the nutritional, <clears throat> excuse me, education who can supplement supplement um, some of my medical care uh, while I'm being taken care of by this individual who may not necessarily believe the way that I do. So you can either switch providers or you can supplement and build a better team. Um, additionally, I would say to just continue to stay educated yourself uh, so that when those when, when a physician comes to you and if you have that experience, you're able to say, hey, listen, this is a study. Um, and PCRM, again, is another great um, website to go to to pull some of these studies and the evidence because that's what doctors speak in. That's our language is in evidence in research. And so if you're able to pull some of those studies, uh, you might be able to convince your doctor otherwise. All right. Final question. Do you need a swig of water? Do you have one more in you? Can we get one more question yeah. answered? Yes. <laughs> All right. Final question comes to us from Dave. A lot of people may be wondering this, especially this time of year. Dave writes, I'm on antibiotics for a stubborn chest infection. How much will they mess up my gut microbes and will eating fermented foods such as cabbage help to counter any effects? Such a good question. I have um, a love-hate relationship with antibiotics. Um, they, I love them for what they can do. And we have made such great strides in uh, medical knowledge and technology in our world to be able to fight off these um, infections, you know, that people otherwise would probably have died from years and years and decades ago. So really, really thankful for antibiotics. What my hate portion of that relationship is that it's they're, they're overused. So my first step here is to stop and ask the individual um, if this antibiotic is number one necessary first off the bat. Oftentimes, um, what we find are in this season, especially there's a lot of viral infections. And we know from studies uh, that antibiotics are over prescribed and they're, and they're not just over prescribed, they're inappropriately prescribed. So for viral infections, which are predominantly what happens around this time and can happen throughout the year, but especially in the winter months, viral, um, viral infections are more prominent. Antibiotics aren't going to do anything for those viral infections. 
And then number two, what the the um, uh, listener had alluded to is it can mess up your gut microbiome, right? So it can cause antibody, something called antibiotic associated diarrhea. There's also severe infections called C. difficile infections that can potentially happen as a result of antibiotic overuse, misuse, et cetera. And so number one, do you really need that antibiotic? Number two, there is a possibility of antibiotic associated diarrhea. Now, can the fermented foods help counteract it? There is some promising data to show that probiotics, when taken with the antibiotic, if they are absolutely necessary, can help to reduce the incidence of antibiotic associated uh, diarrhea. Now with the specifics of which ones, um, you know, does it have to be a supplement versus the foods? I don't have, that is a, you know, million dollar question there, but I imagine, um, and I think that incorporating regularly, you know, fermented foods into your diet, especially when you're taking an antibiotic is going to be beneficial and helpful in reducing your risk of antibiotic associated diarrhea. If we didn't get to your question today, have no fear, we will save it and do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. I'm talking to you, Sherry Reich. Uh, I love your question <laughs> about purple carrots and orange carrots and which one is healthier. So we're, we're going to do our best to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. So keep on posting your questions in the comments or the chat. As always, you can also keep tweeting them to us as well at PCRM or at Chuck Carroll WLC. Just make sure that you use that hashtag exam room live. And by the way, Dr. Jazz, you mentioned the Barnard Medical Center, and people can make an appointment to visit with you, a telemedicine appointment to visit with you right now at barnardmedical.org, or they can call 202-527-7500 to schedule that and get a full list of states where services are available. The people working there can also help wor walk you through the insurance process, really streamline it for you. So barnardmedical.org or 202-527-7500 to make that appointment today. Dr. Jasmine Sardana, thank you so very much and happy holidays. Thank you so much, Chuck. Happy holidays. All right. Coming up on the show tomorrow, it's another big one. Dr. Neil Barnard will be back to answer your questions as well. And there's also a brand new episode of the Exam Room podcast that just got released today. Dr. Neil Barnard and dietitian Lee Crosby, the Fiber Queen, teaming up to answer your questions. A ton of good ones on there as well. So go ahead, head over to Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Look for the Exam Room by the Physicians Committee. Hit that subscribe button and leave a five-star rating and then raise your nutrition ID. Thank you right alongside of us. And thank you for doing that today, by the way. I also want to say thank you one more time to Drs. Hanna Kaliova and Jasmine Sardana for bestowing their wisdom with us and to the crew behind the scenes that made the magic happen. Thank you guys. And to you, my exam roomie, thank you so very much for tuning in as well. For everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. We'll talk to you again tomorrow. But until then, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it plant-based.